Chapter Seven of Warwick the Kingmaker by Charles William Chadwick Ullman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Warwick, Captain of Calais and Admiral. It was in the four years which lay between the fight of St. Albans and the second outbreak of the Civil War in 1459 that Warwick made his reputation and won his popularity up to fourteen fifty five he had been known merely as a capable young nobleman who followed in all things the lead of his father salisbury he had not as yet been given any independent command nor trusted alone in any business of importance though he was already far beyond the age at which many personages of the fifteenth century began to take a prominent part in politics he was now twenty-seven years old eleven years older than henry v when he took over the government of wales nine years older than edward the fourth when he won the battle of mortimer's cross there were no signs in warwick of that premature development which made so many of his contemporaries grown men at sixteen and worn-out veterans at forty unlike most of his house warwick had not been blessed with a large family and beecham had borne him two daughters only both of them delicate girls who did not live to see their thirteenth year no male offspring was ever granted him and it seemed evident that the lands of warwick and despenser were destined to pass once more into the female line but the day was far distant when this was to be and Richard Neville's sturdy frame and constitution, his altitudo animi cum paribus corporis viribus, to quote Polydor Vigil, promised many a long year of vigorous manhood. Warwick had already become a prominent figure in English politics, but not so much from the breadth of his lands or from the promise of military prowess that he had shown at St. Albans as from the almost universal popularity which he enjoyed he was far from being the haughty noble the last of the barons whom later writers have drawn for us his contemporaries speak of him rather as the idol of the commons and the people's friend his words were gentle and he was affable and familiar with all men and never spoke of his own advancement but always of the augmentation and good governance of the realm there never was any peer who was a better lord to his own retainers nor was there any who bore himself more kindly toward the commons hence he won a personal popularity to which his father salisbury never attained and which even his uncle of york could not rival as a school for a man of action there could have been no better post than the governorship of calais the place had been beset by the french ever since the loss of normandy in fourteen fifty and was never out of danger of a sudden attack three times in the last six years considerable armies had marched against it and had only been turned away by unexpected events in other quarters bickering with the french garrisons of boulogne and other neighbouring places never ended even in times of nominal truce to cope with the enemy the captain of calais had a garrison always insufficient in numbers and generally in a state of suppressed mutiny for one of the chief symptoms of the evil rule of Suffolk and Somerset had been the impotence of the central government to find money for the regular war expenses of the realm. The garrison of Calais was perpetually in arrears of pay, and successive governors are found complaining again and again that they are obliged to empty their own pockets to keep the soldiers to their post even the town walls had been allowed to fall into disrepair for want of money to mend them besides his military duties the captain of calais had other difficult functions he lay on the frontier of flanders and a great part of the trade between england and the dominions of the house of burgundy passed through this town for calais was the staple for that branch of commerce hence he had to keep on good terms with the neighbouring burgundian governors and also what was far more difficult to endeavour to sweep the straits of dover clear of pirates and of french privateers whenever there was not an english fleet at sea this was no sinecure 
for of late english fleets had been rarely seen and when they did appear had gone home without effecting anything useful the man who could with a light heart undertake to assume the post of captain of calais must have been both able and self-confident warwick held the place from august fourteen fifty five to august fourteen sixty and combined with it the post of captain to guard the sea from october fourteen fifty seven to september fourteen fifty nine his tenure of office was in every way successful the garrison was brought up to its full strength and put in good discipline largely we may suspect at the expense of the earl's own pocket for after october fourteen fifty six when the duke of york ceased to be protector warwick got little money or encouragement from england he raised the strength of his troops to about two thousand men and was able to assume the offensive against the neighbouring french garrisons his greatest success was when in the spring of the third year of his office he led a body of eight hundred combatants on a daring raid as far as etaples forty miles down the coast to picardy and took the town together with a fleet of wine ships from the south of france which he put up to ransom and so raised a sum large enough to pay his men for some months falling into a disagreement also with the burgundian governors in flanders he made such havoc in the direction of gravelines and saint omer that duke philip was obliged to strengthen his garrisons there and finally was glad to consent to a pacification the negotiations were held in calais and came to a successful conclusion for a commercial treaty was concluded with flanders as well as a mere suspension of arms while warwick lay at calais he could not pay very frequent visits to england for french alarms were always abounding in june of fourteen fifty six for example men said that the siege should come to calais for much people had crossed the water of somme and great navies were on the sea again in may of fourteen fifty seven another threatened attack caused the earl to lay in great stores for which he had to draw on kent so he had the folks of canterbury and sandwich before him and thanked them for their good hearts in victualling of calais and prayed them for continuance therein that those rumours of coming trouble were not all vain was shown a few months later for a norman fleet under peter de Breze threw four thousand men ashore near sandwich in august and the french stormed the town from the land side held it for a day and sacked it from garrett to cellar it was this disaster which england owed to margaret of anjou for she had deliberately suggested the time and place of attack to de Breze in order to bring discredit on the government of the duke of york it is curious to note how the work of the day of st albans was undone without any violent shock during the earlier years of warwick's rule at calais the queen played her game more cautiously than usual first york's protectorate was ended on the excuse that the king whose mind had failed him again after st albans was now himself once more then eight months later a great council was summoned not at london where york was too popular but at coventry the meeting was packed with the men-at-arms of the queen's adherents and at it king henry dismissed the two borcher brothers york's firm supporters from their offices of chancellor and treasurer and replaced them by the earl of shrewsbury a strong adherent of the court party and by wainfleet bishop of winchester it was widely believed that york who had come to the council with no knowledge of the queen's intended coup d'etat would have met with an ill end if his kinsman the duke of buckingham had not succeeded in aiding him to escape of all the offices bestowed as the result of st albans fight warwick's post at calais was the only one which was not now forfeited probably the queen and her friends preferred to keep him oversea as much as possible it is a good testimony to the loyalty of the duke and his friends that they made no stir on their eviction from office york retired to wigmore and for the next year abode quietly upon his estates salisbury went to middleham and remained in the north <laughs> 
meanwhile the country showed its discontent with the renewed rule of the queen tumultuous gatherings took place in oxfordshire and berkshire and again on the welsh border although no leading yorkist was implicated in them the temper of london was so discontented that the queen would not allow the king to approach it for a whole year the ascendancy of the earls of wiltshire beaumont shrewsbury exeter and the other lords who ruled in the king's name and by the queen's guidance proved as unfortunate and as unpopular as any of the other periods during which margaret's friends were at the helm men felt that civil war was destined to break out once more as soon as york should be pressed too hard and find his patience at an end hence general joy was felt when in january of fourteen fifty eight the king taking the initiative for once announced that he was about to reconcile all the private grievances of his lords and invited york salisbury and warwick with the rest of their party to attend a great council at westminster they came but fearing some snare of the queen's came with a numerous following york with a hundred and forty horse salisbury with four hundred warwick with six hundred men of the calais garrison all apparelled in red jackets and blazoned with the beecham badge of the ragged staff there was no snare in the king's invitation and all precautions were taken to prevent affrays the yorkist lords and their retainers were lodged within the city while the queen's friends who appeared in great force the earl of northumberland alone brought three thousand men were provided for in the suburbs the mayor of london godfrey boleyn and boleyn's ancestor with five thousand citizens arrayed in arms kept the streets to guard against brawling between the retainers of the two parties the king at once set forth his purpose of a general pacification and found york and his friends very ready to fall in with his views more trouble was required to induce the sons of those who had fallen at st albans the young somerset clifford and northumberland to pardon those on whose swords was their father's blood but the king's untiring efforts produced the desired result york salisbury and warwick promised to endow the abbey of st albans with a sum of forty five pounds a year to be spent in masses for the souls of the slain and to make large money payments to their heirs york gave the young duke of somerset and his mother five thousand marks and warwick made over one thousand to the young clifford after this curious bargain had been made and a proclamation issued to the effect that both the victors and the vanquished of st albans had acted as true liegemen of the king a solemn ceremony of reconciliation was held the king walked in state to st paul's behind him came the queen led by the duke of york then followed salisbury hand in hand with somerset warwick hand in hand with the duke of exeter and after them their respective adherents two and two the sight must have gladdened the king's kindly heart but no one save his own guileless self could have supposed that such a reconciliation was final almost the whole of his train was destined to die by each other's hands the queen and somerset were one day to behead york and salisbury warwick was destined to slay exeter's son and so all the way down the long procession as one of the tokens of reconciliation warwick was created chief captain to guard the sea a post wherein centred the ambition of his unwilling partner in the great procession the duke of exeter the office was not one with many attractions the royal navy comprised no more than the grace dieu and two or three more large carracks when a fleet was required it was made up by requisitioning hastily armed merchant vessels from the maritime towns of late years whenever such an array was mustered the sailors had gone unpaid and the command had been entrusted to some unskilled leader from the ranks of the court party england had entirely ceased to count as a naval power her coasts were frequently ravaged by french expeditions such as that which had burnt sandwich in fourteen fifty seven and pirates and privateers of all nations swarmed in the channel in his capacity as captain of calais 
warwick had been compelled to learn something of the channel but we should never have guessed that he had accumulated enough of the seaman's craft to make him a competent admiral nevertheless his doings during the twenty months of his command at sea entitle him to a respectable place by the side of blake and monk and our other inland-bred naval heroes he had not merely acquired enough skill to take the charge of a fleet in one of the rough-and-ready sea-fights of the day but actually became a competent seaman at a pinch as he showed a few years later he could himself take the tiller and pilot his ship for a considerable voyage the tale of warwick's first naval venture has been most fortunately preserved to us by the letter of an actor in it on trinity sunday may twenty eighth in the morning writes john jernigan came tidings into my lord of warwick that there were twenty-eight sail of spaniards on the sea whereof sixteen were great ships of foxel and then my lord went and manned five ships of foxel and three carvels and four pinnaces and on the monday we met together before calais at four o'clock in the morning and fought together till ten and there we took six of their ships and they slew of our men about fourscore and hurt two hundred of us right sore and we slew of them about twelve score and hurt a five hundred of them it happed that at the first boarding of them we took a ship of three hundred tons and i was left therein and twenty-three men with me and they fought so sore that our men were fain to leave them then came they and boarded the ship that i was in and there was i taken and was prisoner with them six hours and was delivered again in return for their men that were taken at the first as men say there has not been so great a battle upon the sea these forty winters and to say sooth we were well and truly beaten so my lord has sent for more ships and is like to fight them again in haste such a hard-fought struggle against superior numbers was almost as honourable to warwick's courage and enterprise as a victory and the indomitable pluck which he displayed seems to have won the hearts of the sailors who were ever after down to the day of his death faithful to his cause but his later undertakings were fortunate as well as bold the best known of them took place in the spring of fourteen fifty eight sweeping the channel with fourteen small vessels warwick came on five great ships three great genoese carracks and two spaniards far larger and higher than the others for two days warwick fought a running fight with the enemy hard and long for he had no vessel that could compare in size with theirs finally he took three of the carracks and put the other two to flight nearly a thousand spaniards were slain and the prisoners were so many that the prisons of calais could barely contain them the prizes were richly laden and their contents were valued at no less than ten thousand pounds the markets of calais and kent were for the moment so charged with southern goods that a shilling bought that year more than two would have bought the year before this fight naturally made warwick popular with merchants and sailors but it was less liked at westminster for although at odds with the king of castile england was not at this moment engaged in hostilities with the genoese though there was a dispute in progress about the ill treatment of some british merchants by them another feat of warwick's however was to get him into worse trouble early in the autumn of the same year he had an engagement in the straits of dover with a great fleet of hanseatic vessels from lubeck who were sailing southward to france from them he took five ships which he brought into calais now england had signed a commercial treaty with the hansa only two years before and this engagement was a flagrant violation of it it led warwick's enemies on the continent to call him no better than a pirate what was his plea of justification we do not know it may be as some have alleged that he mistook the germans at first for spaniards or frenchmen it may be that he fell out with them on some question as to the rights of the english admiral in the narrow seas such as gave constant trouble in later centuries and were the forerunners of the famous quarrels over the right of search and the right of salute but about warwick's capture of the hanseatic vessels there was no doubt a month later a board was appointed 
consisting of lord rivers sir thomas currell and seven other members to investigate the matter on november eighth warwick came over from calais to lay his defence before the king and council henry received him courteously enough and there was much sage talk about the marches of picardy but the earl could judge well enough by the countenances of many who sat in the council chamber that they bore him hatred so that he bethought him of the warnings that his father had lately written him about the queen's friends next day when warwick again came into the royal presence the council had hardly begun when a great tumult arose in the court the noise was heard over the whole palace and every one was calling for warwick what had happened was that the retainers of somerset and wiltshire had fallen on the earl's attendants and were making an end of them warwick ran down to see what was the matter but the moment that he appeared in the court he was set on by a score of armed men and it was only by the merest chance that he was able to cut his way down to the water stairs and leap with two of his men into a boat he escaped with his life to the surrey side but his followers were not so lucky three were slain and many wounded warwick declared that the whole business had been a deliberate plot to murder him and he was probably right but the lords of the queen's party maintained that the affray had been a chance medley between the two bands of retainers and that the first blow had been struck by one of warwick's men but whatever was the truth about the matter warwick could not be blamed if he swore never to come to court again without armed men at his heels the sequel of the quarrel shows what had really been intended next day the queen and her friends represented to the king that the quarrel had been due to brawling on warwick's part and procured an order for committing him to the tower warned of this by a secret friend in the council the earl rode off in haste to warwick castle and sent to his father and the duke of york the three held a conference in which they resolved that at the next hostile move of their enemies they would repeat the line of conduct which had been so successful four years before they would muster their retainers and deliver the king by force out of the hands of the court party meanwhile warwick retired to calais where he called together the officers of the garrison and the mayor and aldermen set forth to them the attempt upon his life and begged them to be true to him and guard him against the machinations of his enemies the next attack of the queen on the followers of york was long in coming nine months elapsed between the affray at westminster and the final outbreak of civil war meanwhile says the chronicler the realm of england was out of all good governance as it had been many days before for the king was simple and led by covetous counsel and owed more than he was worth his debts increased daily but payment was there none for all the manors and lordships that pertained to the crown the king had given away so that he had almost not to live on and such impositions as were put on the people as taxes tallages and fifteenths all were spent in vain for the king held no household and maintained no wars so for these misgovernances the hearts of the people were turned from them that had the land and governance and their blessing was turned to cursing the queen and her affinity ruled the realm as they liked gathering riches innumerable the officers of the realm and specially the earl of wiltshire the treasurer for to enrich themselves pilled the poor people and disinherited rightful heirs and did many wrongs the queen was sore defamed and many said that he that was called the prince was not the king's son but gotten in adultery the name of wiltshire the best favoured knight in the land and the most feared of losing his beauty was united with that of margaret by many tongues and the queen's behaviour was certainly curious for instead of staying with her husband she was continually absent from his side busied in all manner of political intrigues and only visiting king henry when some grant or signature had to be wrung out of him all the summer of fourteen fifty nine she was in lancashire and cheshire allying to her the knights and squires in those parts for to have their benevolence and held open household among them and made her son give a livery emblazoned with a swan to all the gentlemen of the country 
trusting through their strength to make her son king for she was making privy means to some lords of england for to stir the king to resign the crown to his son but she could not bring her purpose about the exact details of the outbreak of the war are hard to arrange chronologically writs were being sent about by the queen in the king's name ordering every one to be ready to assemble with as many men as they might defensibly arrayed as early as may but no such muster seems to have taken place and it was not till september that a blow was struck in the middle of that month an army was raised in the midlands with which the king took the field a summons was then sent to salisbury who lay at sheriff houghton in his northern lands bidding him come to london remembering what had happened to his son on his last visit to the king salisbury went not but took the summons combined with the mustering of the king's forces as an alarm of war collecting some three thousand of his yorkshire tenants he marched off to seek his brother-in-law york who was lying at ludlow at the same time he sent messengers to his son at calais bidding him cross over at once to join him warwick seeing that the crisis was come took two hundred men-at-arms and four hundred archers of the garrison of calais under sir andrew trollope a veteran of the french war and crossed to sandwich he left calais where lay his wife and his two daughters in charge of his uncle william neville lord Falconbridge, a little man in stature but a knight of great reverence warwick marched quietly through london and crossed the midlands as far as Cosel in warwickshire without meeting an enemy there he just avoided a battle for somerset with a great force from his wessex lands was marching through the town from south-west to north-east the same day that warwick traversed it from south-east to north-west but as it happened they neither of them caught any sight or heard any rumour of the other while warwick was taking his way through the midlands decisive events had been occurring when the queen who lay at eccles hall in staffordshire heard that salisbury was on his way to york's castle of ludlow she called out all her new-made friends of the northwest midlands and bade them intercept the earl lord audley their leader was given a commission to arrest salisbury and send him to the tower of london all the knighthood of cheshire and shropshire came together and joined audley who was soon at the head of nearly ten thousand men with this force he threw himself across salisbury's path at bloor heath near market drayton on september twenty third the old earl refused to listen to audley's summons to surrender entrenched himself on the edge of a wood and waited to be attacked audley first led two cavalry charges against the yorkist line and when these were beaten back by the arrows of the northern archers launched a great column of billmen and dismounted knights against the enemy after hard fighting it was repulsed audley himself was slain and the lancastrians drew back leaving dead on the field most of those notable knights and squires of cheshire that had taken the badge of the swan in the night salisbury drew off his men and marched round the defeated enemy who still lay in front of his position a curious story is told of his retreat by the chronicler gregory next day he says the earl of salisbury if he had stayed would have been taken so great were the forces that would have been brought up by the queen who lay at eccles hall only six miles from the field but the enemy knew nothing of salisbury's departure because an austin friar shot guns all night in the park at the rear of the field so that they knew not the earl was departed next morning they found neither man nor child in that park save the friar and he said that it was for fear that he abode in that park firing the guns to keep up his heart salisbury was now able to join york at ludlow without further molestation and warwick came in a few days later without having seen an enemy the duke and the younger earl called out their vassals of the welsh march and the united forces soon amounted to twenty thousand men they made no hostile movement however though the lancastrian force defeated at bloor heath was now being joined by new reinforcements and lay opposite them in great strength but the duke and the two earls went forward to worcester and there in the cathedral took a solemn oath that they meant nothing against the king's estate or the common weal of the realm 
they charged the prior of worcester and dr william linwood to lay before the king a declaration that they would forbear and avoid all things that might serve to the effusion of christian blood and would not strike a blow except in self-defence being only in arms to save their own lives the refusal of the yorkist lords to assume the offensive if creditable to their honesty was fatal to their cause for the next three weeks the levies of northern and central england came pouring into the queen's camp and the king himself waking up for once assumed the command in person a curious record in the preamble of an act of parliament of this year tells us how he buckled on his armour and spared not for any impediment or difficulty of way nor intemperance of weather but jeopardied his royal person and continued his labour for thirty days and sometimes lodged in the bare field for two nights together with all his host in the cold season of the year not resting in the same place more than one night save only on the sundays about october twelfth the king whose army now amounted to as many as fifty thousand men pushed slowly forward on to ludlow putting out as he went strongly worded proclamations which stigmatized the duke and the earls as traitors and summoned their followers to disperse promising free pardon to all save salisbury and the others who had fought at bloor heath york and warwick had of course no intention of abandoning their kinsmen they paid no heed to the royal proclamation but they soon found that their followers were far from holding it so lightly the yorkists were so manifestly inferior in numbers to the enemy less than half their force indeed that the men's hearts were failing them their position on the welsh border with the king's army cutting them off from england and with the welsh in arms behind them was unsatisfactory and none of the yorkist barons had succeeded in joining them except lord clinton and lord grey of powis the inaction of their leaders had allowed them time to think over their position and it would appear that the news of the king's proclamation had reached them and the announcement of pardon worked its effect york seems to have recognized that the use of the royal name against him was the fatal thing and proceeded to spread a rumour through his camp that king henry was really dead he even ordered his chaplains to celebrate the mass for the dead in the midst of the camp but the stratagem recoiled on his head next day when the truth became known and the king was seen with his banner displayed at his side leading forward in person the van of the lancastrian army at nightfall on october thirteenth the armies were only separated by the team then in flood and covering the fields for some way on each side of its course the duke set some cannon to play upon the king's line but the darkness or the distance kept them from doing any hurt this was all the fighting that was destined to take place that night demoralization set in among the yorkist ranks it commenced with the veteran trollop who secretly led off his six hundred calais troops from their place in the yorkist line and joined the enemy lord powis followed his example and at dawn the whole army was melting away york bade the bridges be broken down and began to draw off but nothing could keep his men together they were dispersing with such rapidity that he could no longer hope to fight accordingly he bade those who still followed him to save themselves and made off with his two sons edward and edmund warwick and salisbury and a few devoted retainers to seek some place of refuge thus by the route of ludford all the work of bloor heath and st albans was entirely undone End of chapter seven chapter eight of warwick the kingmaker by charles william chadwick oman this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami warwick in exile the adventures of warwick after the army of york broke up have luckily been preserved to us in some detail he and his father together with the duke and his two sons edward and edmund fled southwards together with a few score of horse hotly pursued by sir andrew trollope and his men so close was the chase that john and thomas neville who lingered behind their brother and father both having been wounded at bloor heath were taken prisoners 
presently the party was forced to break up by the imminence of their peril the duke of york and his second son edmund turned off into wales with the design of taking ship for ireland salisbury warwick and edward plantagenet the young earl of march york's eldest son and salisbury's godchild and nephew accompanied by sir john dinham and only two persons more fled across herefordshire by cross-roads avoiding the towns and then by a hazardous journey through gloucestershire and somersetshire reached the coast of devon apparently somewhere near barnstable there the fugitives turned into a fishing village where sir john dinham bought for two hundred and twenty-two nobles the sum of the party's resources a one-masted fishing smack he gave out that he was bound for bristol and hired a master and four hands to navigate the little vessel when they had got well out from land warwick asked the master if he knew the seas of cornwall and the english channel the man answered that he was quite ignorant of them and had never rounded the land's end then all that company was much cast down but the earl seeing that his father and the rest were sad said to them that by the favour of god and st george he would himself steer them to a safe port and he stripped to his doublet and took the helm himself and had the sail hoisted and turned the ship's bows westward much to the disgust we doubt not of the master and his four hands who had not counted on such a voyage when they hired themselves to sail to bristol town it was not for nothing that warwick had ranged the channel for two years he now proved that he was a competent seaman by navigating the little vessel down the bristol channel round the land's end and across to guernsey here they were eight days wind-bound but putting forth on the ninth ran safely up the channel and came ashore at calais on november third just twenty days after the rout of ludford counting the crew they had been eleven souls in the vessel warwick found calais still safe in the hands of his uncle Falkenbridge, whom he had left in charge of the town and of his wife and daughters when he went to england two months before overjoyed at the news Falkenbridge came to meet him on the quay and fell on his neck then all those lords went together in pilgrimage to notre dame de st pierre and gave thanks for their safety and when they came into calais the mayor and the aldermen and the merchants of the staple came out to meet them and made them good cheer and that night they were merry enough when they thought they might have found calais already in the hands of their enemies such indeed might well have been their fortune for the duke of somerset was already at sandwich with some hundreds of men-at-arms the king had appointed him captain of calais and he was on his way to remove Falkenbridge and get the town into his own keeping but the southwest wind which blew warwick up from guernsey had kept somerset on shore that very evening the wind shifted and late at night somerset's herald appeared before the water gate to warn the garrison that his master would arrive to take command next day then the guard answered the herald that they would give his news to the earl of warwick who was their sole and only captain and that he should have warwick's answer in a few minutes the herald was much abashed and got him away and went back that same night to his master no one in england knew what had become of warwick or salisbury and somerset's surprise was as great as his wrath when he found that they had anticipated him at calais next morning he set sail with his forces of which the greater part were comprised of sir andrew trollope's soldiers making for guine with the intention of attacking calais from the land side but a tempest rose up while he was at sea and though he and most of his men came ashore at Gien, the vessels that contained their horses and stores and armour were driven into calais harbour for safety and compelled to surrender to warwick the earl thanked providence for the present and not the duke of somerset and was much pleased at the chance for his men were greatly in want of arms he had the prisoners forth and went down their ranks then he picked out those that had been officers under him and had sworn the oath to him as captain of calais and threw them into prison but the rest he sent away in safety saying that they had but served their king to the best of their knowledge only lord audley somerset's second in command 
son to the peer whom salisbury had slain at bloor heath was not permitted to depart and was consigned to the castle but the men who had broken their oath to warwick were brought out into the market-place next day and beheaded before a great concourse of citizens somerset and sir andrew trollope had been received into Guine and made it their headquarters but for some time they could do nothing against calais because they were in want of arms and horses it was not till they had got themselves refitted by help of the french of boulogne that they were able to harm warwick meanwhile they were practically cut off from england for warwick's ships held the straits and neither news nor men came across to them presently somerset set to work to intercept warwick's supply of provisions which was drawn mainly from flanders and the earl had to arrange that every market-day parties of the garrison should ride out to escort the flemings in their wagons it might have gone hard with calais if this source of supply had been cut off but warwick had concluded secret agreement with duke philip by which the introduction of food into the town was to be winked at by the flemish officials notwithstanding any treaties with england that might exist neither somerset nor warwick got much profit out of the continual skirmishes that resulted from the attempts of the lancastrians to cut off the wagon trains from dunkirk and gravelines so passed the months of november and december fourteen fifty nine with no stirring incidents but plenty of bickering but christmas tide brought with it abundant excitement the queen had at last taken measures to reinforce somerset and lord rivers with his son sir anthony woodville had come down to sandwich with a few hundred men to take the first safe opportunity of crossing to guine but the time was stormy and the troops mutinous they got little or no pay and scattered themselves over the neighbourhood to live at free quarters so that rivers lay in sandwich almost unattended so at christmas tide the earl called together his men-at-arms and asked whether it was not possible to get back his great ship that he had used when he was admiral for it lay at sandwich in lord rivers hands with several ships more and sir john dinham answered yea and swore to take it back with god's aid if the earl would give him four hundred men to sail with him so the earl bade his men arm and fitted out his vessels and he gave the charge of the business to sir john dinham and sir john wenlock that wise knight who had done many feats of arms in his day they set out at night and arrived off sandwich before dawn waiting for the tide to rise they ran into the harbour at five in the morning no one paid any attention to them for the men of sandwich thought they were but timber ships from the baltic as all the men-at-arms were kept below hatches there was no stir in the town and wenlock was able to seize the ships and fit them out in haste while dinham swept the streets and caught lord rivers men-at-arms as they turned out to see what was the matter sir anthony woodville was captured one hour later as he rode into the town from london whither he had gone to ask the queen for a supply of money lord rivers himself was found still asleep in his bed at the black friars and carried on board his own ship before he could realize what was happening the men of sandwich like the rest of the kentish men had no desire to harm the yorkists so that there was no fighting and dinham and wenlock sailed home at their ease without striking a single blow with their prisoners and all the warships in the port save the grasse dieu alone which was found quite unready for the sea that evening they were again in calais and landed in triumph to deliver their spoils to warwick a quaint and undignified scene followed when the prisoners were brought out so that evening lord rivers and his son were taken before the three earls accompanied by a hundred and sixty torches and first the earl of salisbury rated lord rivers calling him a knave's son that he should have been so rude as to call him and these other lords traitors for they should be found the king's true lieges when he should be found a traitor indeed and then my lord warwick rated him and said that his father was but a squire in that he had made himself by his marriage and was but a maid lord so that it was not his part to hold such language of lords of the king's blood and then my lord of march rated him likewise lastly sir anthony was rated for his language of all three lords in the same manner 
if rivers had any sense of humour he must have felt the absurdity of being raided by the nevilles who more than any other race in england had risen by a series of wealthy alliances for having made himself by his marriage but probably anger and fear were sufficient to keep him from any such reflections we could wish that warwick had been less undignified in the hour of his triumph but if his words were rough his actions were not rivers and his son were sent to join lord audley in the castle but they were well treated in their captivity and came to no harm before many months were out they joined their captor's cause it would have been hard for the actors in the scene to foresee the changes that ten years were to make in their relations to each other by fourteen seventy rivers was destined to find himself the father-in-law of the young earl of march who was now exercising his tongue against him in imitation of the nevilles and to lose his life in the service of the house of york warwick on the other hand was to become the deadly enemy of the young prince whom he was now harbouring and training in arms and to adopt the lancastrian cause which rivers had deserted the months of january and february passed in continual skirmishing with somerset and the garrison of Guine, which led to no marked result but about the beginning of lent news arrived at calais that the duke of york of whom nothing definite had been heard since october was now in great force in ireland where he had got possession of dublin and was greatly strengthened by the earls and homagers of that country warwick at once resolved to sail to ireland to concert measures with his uncle and to learn if it would be possible to invade england for it was obvious that unless some vigorous offensive action were taken in the spring the lancastrians would finally succeed in bringing enough men across to form the siege of calais and then the town could not hold out for ever accordingly though the storms of march were at their highest warwick equipped his ten largest ships manned them with one thousand five hundred sailors and men-at-arms the best stuff in calais and sailed down the channel for ireland the voyage was undisturbed by the enemy but terribly tempestuous and protracted however the earl reached waterford at last and found there not only york and his son rutland but his own mother the countess of salisbury who had fled over to ireland when she heard that her name was inserted among the list of persons attainted by the lancastrian parliament which met at leicester in december fourteen fifty nine warwick found the duke in good spirits and so hopeful that he was ready to engage to land in wales in june with all the force that could be raised in ireland if warwick would promise to head a descent on kent at the same moment this plan was agreed upon and the earl set sail to return about may first taking with him his mother who was anxious to rejoin her husband whom she had not seen for nearly a year meanwhile the news of warwick's departure for ireland had reached the lancastrian government and the duke of exeter warwick's successor in the office of admiral had sworn to prevent him from returning to calais accordingly exeter with the great ship called the grace dieu and three great carracks and ten other ships all well armed and ordered was now besetting the channel when warwick was off start point the vessel which sailed in advance of his squadron to reconnoitre the way returned in haste with the news that a squadron was lying off dartmouth and that some fishing boats with whom communication had been held reported the duke of exeter to be in command warwick was resolved to fight though the enemy was considerably superior in force he sent for his captains on board his carvel and prayed that they would serve him loyally that day for he had good hope that god would give him the victory to which they answered that they were well disposed enough for a fight and that the men were in good heart accordingly the earl's ten ships formed line and bore down on the duke's fourteen a fight appeared imminent when suddenly the whole lancastrian fleet went about and fled in disorder into dartmouth harbour which lay just behind them this unexpected action was caused by mutiny on board when the duke had given orders to prepare for action his officers had come to him in dismay to announce that the men would not arm to fight their old commander and that if he came any nearer to the earl the crews would undoubtedly rise and deliver them over to the enemy 
Accordingly, Exeter gave orders to retire into the harbour. Warwick, however, could not know of the cause of the enemy's retreat, and having a good west wind behind him, and a great desire to get back to Calais, from which he had now been absent more than ten weeks, pursued his journey without attempting anything against Dartmouth. He reached Calais in safety on June 1st, and was proud to restore his mother, who had suffered grievously from the sea during her voyage to his father's arms. Salisbury and Fokenbridge had been much alarmed at the length of his absence, and the more faint-hearted of the garrison had begun to murmur that he had deserted them for good, and had fled to foreign parts to save his own person. Now, however, all was stir and bustle in Calais, for Salisbury and Fokenbridge thoroughly approved of the plan of invasion which had been concerted at Dublin. The news from England, indeed, was all that could be desired. The reckless attainting of all the Yorkists by the Parliament of Leicester had met with grave disapproval. The retainers of the Lancastrian lords had been committing all sorts of misdoings, chief among which was the unprovoked sack of the town of Newbury by the followers of Ormond, Earl of Wiltshire. London was murmuring savagely at the execution of seven citizens, who in company with a gentleman of the house of Neville had been caught in the Thames on their way to Calais to join the earls, the unlearned preachers whom the government put up to preach against York at Paul's Cross were hooted down by the mob. The commons of Kent were signifying in no doubtful terms their willingness to join the earls the moment that the banner of the white rose should be unfurled in England. A fragment of a ballad hung by an unknown hand on the gate of Canterbury in June is worth quoting as an expression of their feelings. Send home, most gracious Jesu, most benign, send home the true blood to his proper vine, Richard, Duke of York, thy servant and sign, whom Satan not seetheth to set it disdain, and by thee preserve it he may not be slain. Set him ut sedeat in principibus, as he did before, and so to our new song, Lord, thine ear incline, Gloria lauset on or tibi sit Christe redemptor. Edward, the Earl of March, whose fame the earth shall spread, Richard, Earl of Salisbury, named Prudence, with that noble knight and flower of manhood, Richard, Earl of Warwick, shield of our defence, also little Falconbridge, a knight of great reverence, Jesu, restore them to the honour they had before. Nor was it only the commons that were ready to join in a new appeal to arms. The partisans of York among the great houses who had not definitely committed themselves at the time of the rout of Ludford, and so had escaped arrest and attainder, let it be known at Calais that they were ready for action. Chief among them was the Duke of Norfolk, and the two brothers Lord Borcher and Borcher, Archbishop of Canterbury, who pledged themselves to put their retainers in motion the moment that Warwick should cross the sea. It was in no spirit of recklessness, then, that Warwick resolved to cross into Kent in the last week of June with every man he could spare from Calais. As a preliminary to his advance, he had resolved to clear away the only Lancastrian force that was watching him, a body of five hundred men-at-arms which had been sent down to Sandwich to replace Lord Rivers' troops and to endeavour to communicate with Somerset at Guine. This body was commanded by Osbert Mundford, one of the officers of the Calais garrison who had deserted Warwick in company with Sir Andrew Trollope. Accordingly, on June twenty-fifth, Sir John Denham, the captor of Rivers, sailed over to Sandwich for the second time and fell on Mundford's force. There was a hot skirmish, for on this occasion the Lancastrians were not caught sleeping, but again the Yorkists won the day. Dinham indeed was wounded by a shot from a bombard, but his men stormed the town, routed the enemy, and took Mondford prisoner. He was sent over to Calais, where he was tried for deserting his captain, as the prisoners of November 3rd had been, and beheaded next day outside the walls. On the 27th, Warwick himself, his father, the Earl of March, Lord Falconbridge, Wenlock, and the rest of the leaders at Calais crossed over to Sandwich with two thousand men in good array, leaving in the town the smallest garrison that could safely be trusted with the duty of keeping out Somerset. They had published before their landing a manifesto, which set out the stereotyped Yorkist grievances once more 
the weak government the crushing taxes the exclusion of the king's relatives from his council the diversion of the revenue into the pockets of the courtiers the misdoings of individual lancastrian chiefs the oppression of the king's lieges and all the other customary complaints the three earls had only been in sandwich a few hours when as had been agreed the archbishop of canterbury came to join them with many of the tenants of the sea arrayed in arms they then moved forward with numbers increasing at every step for the kentishmen came to meet them by thousands and no one raised a hand against them the lancastrians had been caught wholly unprepared they seemed to have been expecting raids from warwick on the eastern coast not on the southern and except munford's routed force there was no one in arms south of the thames the king and queen were at coventry and most of the lancastrian lords scattered each in his own lands lord scales and lord hungerford were in command of london where there were present a few other notables lord vesey lord lovell and john de foix titular earl of kendal these leaders endeavoured to fortify the city posting guns on london bridge and placing their retainers in the tower but the aspect of the citizens was threatening and warwick was known to be coming on fast the landing had taken place on the twenty seventh and on july first the three earls and the archbishop of canterbury were already before the walls of london they had marched over seventy miles in four days taking the route of canterbury rochester and dartford and were at hand long before they were expected when the archbishop's herald summoned the town there was some attempt made by the lancastrian lords to offer resistance but the mob rose and drove them into the tower while a deputation of aldermen went forth to offer a free entry to the yorkist army on july third the three earls entered london in state conducted by the archbishop and a papal legate a certain bishop of teramo who had been sent by pius the second to endeavour to reconcile the english factions and to get them to join in a crusade he had allowed himself to be talked over by warwick and did all in his power to further the cause of york the earls rode to st paul's and there before a great multitude both clerical and lay warwick recited the cause of their coming into the land how they had been put out from the king's presence with great violence so that they might not come to his highness to excuse themselves of the accusations laid against them but now they were come again by god's mercy accompanied by their people for to come into his presence there to declare their innocence or else to die upon the field and there he made an oath upon the cross of canterbury that they bore true faith and allegiance to the king's person whereof he took christ and his holy mother and all the saints of heaven to witness we shall see that this last promise was not an entirely unmeaning formula in warwick's mouth and that his oath was not like the deliberate perjuries to which others of his contemporaries notably edward the fourth were prone End of chapter eight chapter nine of warwick the kingmaker by charles william chadwick oman this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Victory and Disaster, Northampton and St. Albans. When the arrival of the three earls in London was known, all the Yorkist peers who were within touch of London came flocking in with their retainers. Thither came Warwick's uncle, Edward Neville, Lord Abergavenny, and his brother, george neville bishop of exeter and his cousin lord scroop and clinton one of the victors of st albans and borcher and cobham and say and the bishops of ely salisbury and rochester it is strange to read that audley who had been warwick's prisoner in calais ever since last november also joined the yorkists in arms he had come to terms with his captor and had agreed to forget the death of his father at bloor heath and to serve the cause of york in a few days an army of more than thirty thousand men had been gathered together the first task of the yorkists was to provide for the blockade of the tower of london where hungerford and scales abode in great wrath shooting wildfire into the town every hour and laying great ordnance against it <laughs> 
Salisbury agreed to remain in charge of the city and to undertake the siege. With him were left Lord Cobham, Sir John Wenlock, and the greater part of the levy of London, commanded by the Lord Mayor and by one Harrow, a mercer. They brought batteries to bear on the tower from the side of St. Catherine's Wharf, so they skirmished together daily and much harm was done. Meanwhile Warwick and the young Earl of March set out on Saturday, July 5th, having with them the other Yorkist lords, and much people out of Kent, Sussex, and Essex with much great ordnance. Marching by the Great North Road past St. Albans and Toaster, they made for Northampton, where they heard that the king was collecting his host. The invasion of England had been so sudden and its success so rapid that the Lancastrians had not had time to call in all their strength, more especially as it lay to a great extent in the extreme north and west. But the Midlands were well roused, and if a Yorkist chronicler is to be believed, the Queen had it proclaimed in Cheshire and Lancashire that if so the king had the victory of the earls, then every man should take what he might and make havoc in Kent, Essex, Middlesex, Surrey, and Sussex. The Duke of Buckingham had the chief command, though he was not of the court party nor a great lover of the queen's, but out of sheer loyalty. He now, as formerly at St. Albans, came out with all his retainers when he received the king's missive. With him was Egremont and Beaumont, both deadly enemies of the Nevilles and favourites of the Queen, the Earl of Shrewsbury, Lord Grey de Ruthen, and many more. Their forces, though very considerable, were still somewhat inferior to those of the Yorkists. The King's camp was pitched just outside Northampton Town in the meadows south of the Nen, near the nunnery between Sandiford and Hardingstone. The position had been strongly entrenched, and the earthworks were lined with a numerous artillery. The river covered both flanks, the lines being drawn from point to point in a broad bend of its course. Warwick, in accordance with his declaration at St. Paul's on the previous Thursday, made three separate attempts to secure permission to approach the king's person, but Buckingham sternly refused to listen to his envoys, the bishops of Rochester and Salisbury. You came here not as bishops to treat of peace, but as men-at-arms, he said, pointing to the squadrons arrayed under the bishops' banners in the Yorkist host. Negotiations were fruitless, and at two in the afternoon Warwick drew out his army on the rising ground by the old Danish camp, the Hunsborough, which overlooks the water meadows, and descended to the attack. Folkenbridge led the vanguard on the left, the earl himself the centre, Edward of March, now seeing his first stricken field, conducted the right wing. Before the attack it was proclaimed that every man should spare the commons, and slay none but the knights and lords, with whom alone lay the blame for the shedding of all the blood that might fall that day. The first assault on the Lancastrian lines failed completely. The obstacles were far greater than Warwick had imagined. It was six feet from the bottom of the ditch to the top of the rampart, and the trenches were full of water, for it had rained heavily in the morning. How the day would have gone if treachery had not come to the succor of the Yorkists, it is impossible to say, but only a few minutes after the first gun had been fired, Lord Grey de Ruthen on the Lancastrian left mounted the badge of the ragged staff, and his men were seen beckoning to the Yorkists to approach, and leaning over the rampart to reach their hands to pull them up. Assisted in this way, the Earl of March's columns got within the entrenchments, and sweeping along their front cleared a space for Warwick to burst in. All was over in half an hour, and with very little bloodshed. Only three hundred men fell, but among them were nearly all the Lancastrian leaders. On foot and in their heavy armor, the lords and knights could not get away. The aged Buckingham fell at the door of his own tent, and Beaumont, Egremont, and Shrewsbury, close to the king's quarters, as they strove to protect his retreat. But the king, helpless as ever, was too late to fly, and fell into the hands of an archer named Henry Montford. His capture, however, was not so important, so long as his wife and child remained at large, and Margaret, as adroit as her husband was shiftless, was already speeding away with the young prince 
bound for North Wales. Warwick and March conducted King Henry back with all respect to London, where he was lodged in the palace at Westminster. They had done their work so rapidly that they had not needed the assistance of the Duke of York, whose arrival from Ireland, he was two months later than his promise, was just announced from the West. Even before he appeared, the victors of Northampton had begun to reconstitute the king's ministry. Henry was made to sign patents appointing Salisbury lieutenant in the six northern counties. His son, George, Bishop of Exeter, received the chancellorship. John Neville, another son, was made the king's chamberlain, and Lord Borcher got the treasury. Warwick himself was re-established de jure in the position he had been so long holding de facto, the captainship of Calais. The garrison of the Tower of London surrendered nine days after the Battle of Northampton. Most of the defenders went away at safety, but Lord Scales, who was much hated by the populace of London, was not so fortunate. He took boat for the sanctuary of Westminster, but was recognized as he rode along by some watermen, who gave chase to him and slew him on the river, just under the river wall of Winchester House. His body was stripped and thrown ashore into the cemetery of St. Mary Overy, whence it was removed and honorably buried by the earls of March and Warwick that night. Great pity was it that so noble a knight, so well approved in the wars of France and Normandy, should die so mischievously, adds the chronicler. A parliament was summoned by the Yorkists to meet on October 9th. Meanwhile, Warwick was well employed. When August came round, he ran across to Calais to see to his old antagonist at Guine. Somerset was now in low spirits and willingly met the Earl at Newham Bridge, there to be reconciled to him and make peace. But after he had embraced Warwick and assented to all his conditions, he secretly departed with his follower Trollope, fled through Picardy to Dieppe, and took refuge in his own southwestern county. Meanwhile, the earl conducted his mother and wife in great state back to London, and re-established them in their old dwelling of the harbor. He spent September in going on a pilgrimage with the countess to the shrine of the Virgin at Walsingham in Norfolk. On this journey he ran great peril, for Lord Willoughby, an unreconciled Lancastrian lay in wait for him near Lichfield on his return, and was within an ace of making him prisoner. So Warwick came at last to his own Midland estates, and there all the knights and ladies of his lands came to him, complaining of the evils that they had suffered in the past year from the Duke of Somerset, who had pilled and robbed them, and sacked their towns and manors, and usurped the earl's castles, but notwithstanding all their troubles they praised heaven for the joyous return of their lord. York had reached Chester early in September, and had marched slowly through his estates in the Welsh march toward London. When he came to Abingdon, he sent for trumpeters and clariners from London, and gave them banners with the royal arms of England without distinction or diversity, and commanded his sword to be borne upright before him, and so he rode till he came to the gates of the palace of Westminster. This assumption of royal state was the beginning of evils. Meanwhile the Parliament was already sitting before the Duke's arrival. King Henry opened it with due solemnity, and heard it commence its work by repealing all the acts of the Lancastrian Parliament of Leicester, and by removing the attainders of the Yorkist lords. On the third day of the session, Richard of York came up in the evening and entered the palace, where he rudely took possession of the royal apartments. He had the doors broken open, and King Henry, hearing the great noise, gave place and took him another chamber that night. This unceremonious eviction of his sovereign was only the beginning of the Duke's violent conduct. Next morning he went to the House of Lords, and approaching the throne, laid his hand on the cushion, as if about to take formal possession of the seat. Archbishop Borcher asked him what he would do, and the Duke then made a lengthy reply, 
challenging and claiming the realm and crown of england as male heir of king richard the second and proposing without any delay to be crowned on all hallows day then following the lords listened with obvious disapproval and dismay and york did not even venture to seat himself on the throne the meeting broke up without further transaction of business now when the earl of warwick who had not been present that day heard this he was very wroth and sent for the archbishop and prayed him to go to the duke and tell him that he was acting evilly and to remind him of the many promises he had made to king henry warwick in short remembered his oath of july fourth and was determined that henry should not be despoiled of his throne but only placed in the hands of yorkist ministers the archbishop refused to face the duke then the earl sent for his brother thomas neville and entered into his barge and rode to the palace it was all full of the duke's men-of-arms but the earl stayed not and went straight to the duke's chamber and found him standing there leaning against a sideboard and there were hard words between them for the earl told him that neither the lords nor the people would suffer him to strip the king of his crown and as they wrangled the earl of rutland came in and said to his cousin fair sir be not angry for you know that we have the true right to the crown and that my lord and father here must have it but the earl of march his brother stayed him and said brother vex no man for all shall be well but the earl of warwick would stay no longer when he understood his uncle's intent and went off hastily to his barge greeting no one as he went save his cousin of march next day when his wrath had cooled down the earl sent to his uncle the bishops of ely and rochester lord audley and a london citizen named gray to beg and beseech him to give up his enterprise the duke sent them away with the answer that he would be crowned the very next monday the day of the translation of st edward the confessor october thirteenth the preparations for the coronation were actually made and the crowd was mustering in the abbey when on a last appeal made by sir thomas neville in the name of his brother and of all the lords and commonalty of england the duke wavered fearing to offend his greatest supporters beyond redemption he temporized put off the coronation and began to negotiate richard neville in fact had matched his will against that of his imperious uncle and had won the duke was never crowned the arrangement at which the parties arrived was that henry should be king for life that york should be made protector named prince of wales duke of cornwall and earl of chester and should be acknowledged as heir to the throne the duke on the other hand swore to be faithful to the king so long as he should live on all saints day the agreement was solemnly ratified at st paul's whither the lords went in procession warwick bearing the sword before the king and edward of march bearing the king's mantle and all the crowd shouted long live king henry and the earl of warwick for the said earl had the good voice of the people because he knew how to give them fair words showing himself easy and familiar with them for he was very subtle at gaining his ends and always spoke not of himself but of the augmentation and good governance of the kingdom for which he would have spent his life and thus he had the good will of england so that in all the land he was the lord who was held in most esteem and faith and credence the act of parliament which recorded the agreement of york and king henry made no mention of queen margaret or of the prince her son but it was of little use passing acts of parliament while she was at large and the lancastrian lords of the north and west unsubdued margaret's first move had been to stir up the scots and at her bidding james the second crossed the border and laid siege to roxburgh which was then an english town Falkenbridge, Warwick's uncle, was sent north to defend the place, but later events deprived him of aid from England, and he was forced to surrender, though not till after the King of Scots had fallen, slain by the bursting of one of his own siege guns. But the Scotch invasion was only one of Margaret's schemes. Her main hope 
lay in a rising of the lancastrians who had not suffered at northampton and from her retreat at harlech in north wales she sent to summon them together their mustering place was in the north where the earl of northumberland and lord neville brother of reef earl of westmoreland and clifford son of the clifford who fell at st albans united their retainers as the nucleus of an army to them fled somerset regardless of his oath at calais and exeter the late admiral and courtney earl of devon and willoughby and ruse and hungerford and many more the danger was so imminent that the duke of york after wearing the honours of the protectorate for no more than three weeks resolved to march north and disperse the gathering of the queen's friends he took with him his second son edmund of rutland a boy of seventeen salisbury accompanied him and he also left his first-born at home and went out with his fourth son thomas neville the duke and the earl raised about six thousand men and proceeded on their way unopposed save by a small lancastrian force which they beat at worksop till they reached sandal castle one of york's family strongholds close beside the town of wakefield when they arrived there about christmas eve they learnt that the queen's army was much stronger than they had reckoned and sent south for reinforcements but on december thirtieth they were themselves assailed by forces tripling their own small host under somerset and clifford the duke rashly fought in the open though many of his men were scattered over the countryside foraging it is said that he relied on help treacherously promised him by some of the lancastrian leaders but he was disappointed no one played for his benefit the part that grey de ruthen had carried out at northampton the defeat of the yorkists was decisive two thousand two hundred men out of their five thousand were slain the fate of war fell heavily on the leaders hardly one of them escaped the duke fell on the field with thomas neville and william lord harrington the earl of rutland the best disposed young gentleman in england was slain in the pursuit as he fled across wakefield bridge salisbury's fate was more unhappy still he was taken prisoner and beheaded next day at pontefract by the bastard of exeter though he offered great sums of money that he should have grant of his life the heads of salisbury and his son of harrington and of five knights were set on spikes over the gate of york with that of duke richard in the midst crowned with a paper crown in mockery of the prospective kingship that he had never enjoyed all the lancastrians of the north and the midlands rose at once to join the queen she was soon at the head of forty thousand men largely composed of the lawless moss troopers of the scotch border who looked upon war as a mere excuse for raids and boasted that everything beyond the trent was in an enemy's country before moving south they harried most thoroughly the estates of the northern yorkists salisbury's patrimony about middleham and sheriff houghton bore the brunt of the plunder at the hands of the retainers of the elder branch of neville whose head earl rafe of westmoreland put his men under the charge of his brother thomas one of the most rabid lancastrians in the north country about the middle of january the queen's army began to roll southward pillaging recklessly on all sides and sagging from roof to cellar the towns of grantham stamford peterborough huntingdon royston melbourne and dunstable as they passed down the ermine street the news of the battle of wakefield reached london about january fifth and set the whole south country in dismay warwick who had been keeping his christmas on his own estates was forced to ride up to the capital at full speed and assume the direction of affairs for there was now no one to share the responsibility with him his uncle in whose cause he had fought so long and his father whose prudent counsels had guided the party were both gone his cousin of march the head of the family was no more than nineteen years of age and was moreover at this moment far away by the severn looking after the welsh march it devolved on warwick to assume the responsibility for the government of the kingdom and the safety of the yorkist party 
though there were traitors enough ready to change to the winning side as was always the case in this unhappy war the southeastern counties were firm to york even in the darkest hour warwick found ready assistance in the duke of norfolk the archbishop of canterbury the earl of arundel the lords bunville cobham fitzwalter and the commons of kent and london in this country wrote a partisan of york every man is well willing to go with my lords here and i hope god shall help them for the people of the north rob and steal and are appointed to pillage all this country and give away men's goods and livelihoods in all the south country and that shall be a mischief to resist the advance of the queen on london warwick marched out to st albans and arrayed some thirty thousand men to cover the london road his army was drawn up not in the great masses which were usual at this time but in detachments scattered along a front of three miles the right on a heath called no man's land the left in st albans town the countryside was full of woods and hedges which were manned by archers supported by a body of burgundian handgun men whom warwick had hired in flanders king henry was taken along with the army and stationed in the rear in charge of lord bonville the position was strong but the communication between its various parts was bad and the whole force of warwick's men seemed to have been ill-placed for concentration owing to some mismanagement of the officer commanding the mounted scouts the Lancastrians attacked before they were expected. The Queen's men were at hands with the earls in the town of St. Albans, while all things were set to seek and out of order, for the prickers came not home to bring tidings that the Queen was at hand, save one, and he came and said that she was yet nine miles off. The first Lancastrian attack on the left in St. Albans town was beaten back, but in another part of the field a fatal disaster took place a kentish squire named lovelace who led a company in the right wing went over to the enemy and let the lancastrians through the yorkist line king henry was captured by his wife's followers as he sat under a great oak smiling to see the discomfiture of the army when the news ran along the front that treachery was at work and that the king had been taken, the bulk of the Yorkists broke up and fled. Not more than three thousand were slain or taken, but the whole force was irretrievably scattered, and the greater part of the leaders fled home to their own lands as if the war was over. Queen Margaret showed her joy at the recovery of her husband's person by an exhibition of savage cruelty. Lord Bonville and Sir Thomas Kirrell, who had been in charge of Henry, and had been captured with him were brought before her so she told them they must die and sent for her son the prince of wales and said that he should choose what death they should suffer and when the boy he was eight years old was brought into the tent she said fair son what manner of death shall these knights whom you see here die and the young child answered let them have their heads taken off then said sir thomas may god destroy those who taught thee this manner of speech but immediately they drew them out and cut off both their heads february seventeenth fourteen sixty one end of chapter nine chapter ten of warwick the kingmaker by charles william chadwick omen this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Towton Field. The dispersion of the Yorkist army seems to have been so complete that Warwick could not gather together more than four or five thousand of the thirty thousand men who had stood in line at St. Albans. With this small force, he considered himself unable to protect London, and he therefore retreated not southward but westward intending to fall back on his own midland estates to raise fresh troops and join the earl of march in the west he only sent to london to order that his young cousins george and richard of york now boys of eleven and nine respectively should be sent overseas to take refuge in flanders 
accordingly warwick now marched by vile cross-country roads and in the worst days of february which was long remembered for its rains and inundations across buckinghamshire and oxfordshire to chipping norton here he met with the earl of march whose proceedings during the last month require a word of notice edward was at gloucester when the news of wakefield reached him and saw at once that troops must be raised to help warwick to defend london accordingly he moved into the welsh marches and hastily called together some ten or eleven thousand men with these he would have marched east if it had not been that mid wales had risen in behalf of queen margaret and that he himself was beset by forces headed by jasper earl of pembroke jasper's father owen tudor the husband of the queen dowager and james earl of wiltshire before he could move to succour warwick he must free himself from these adversaries in his rear the campaign in the west was short and sharp the earl of march met the welsh at mortimer's cross in north herefordshire near wigmore on february second and gave them a crushing defeat owen tudor was taken prisoner and beheaded and his head was set on the highest step of the market cross at hereford and a madwoman combed his hair and washed away the blood from his face and got candles and set them about the head burning more than a hundred no one hindering her the earls of pembroke and wiltshire escaped and joined queen margaret with the wrecks of their army the moment that he had crushed the welsh lancastrians and settled the affairs of the march edward had set out for london hoping to arrive in time to aid warwick he could not achieve the impossible but he had passed the severn crossed the bleak cotswolds and reached chipping norton by february twenty second having left some of his troops behind in wales he had not more than eight or nine thousand of his march men with him under hastings destined one day to be the victim of richard of gloucester sir john wenlock and william herbert the future earl of pembroke the news that reached warwick and the earl of march at chipping norton was so startling that it caused them to change their whole plan of operations and to march straight upon london instead of merely gathering fresh strength to make head in a new campaign in the west midlands the course of events after the fight of st albans had been exactly the reverse of what might have been expected from the queen's fiery temper and the reckless courage of the northern bands that followed her the battle had been fought upon february seventeenth the troops of warwick had retired westward on the eighteenth the victorious army was within thirteen miles of london and there was nothing to prevent the queen from entering the city next day it is one of the most curious problems of english history to find that the lancastrians lay for eight days quiescent and made no endeavour to replace the king in his capital knowing the extraordinary apathy which the citizens displayed all over england during the wars of the roses we may be sure that the londoners in spite of their preference for york would not have ventured to exclude the northern army when it claimed admittance at their gates but on this one occasion queen margaret displayed not only her usual want of judgment but a want of firmness that was foreign to her character king henry asserting for once some influence on politics and asserting it to his own harm had determined to spare london and the home counties the horrors of plunder at the hands of the northern hordes not an armed force but a few envoys were sent to london while the main body of the troops was held back and the van pushed no farther than barnet simultaneously the king issued strenuous proclamations against raiding of any kind this ordinance caused vast murmuring among the northern men observes the abbot of st albans on whom the king was quartered but had not the least effect in curbing their propensity to plunder the londoners had quite made up their minds to submit their only thought was to buy their pardon as cheaply as possible at the king's hands on the twentieth they sent the duchesses of bedford and buckingham the widows of the great regent of france and of the lancastrian duke slain at northampton 
together with certain aldermen to plead for grace and peace at the hands of the queen the king and queen were found at barnet whither they had moved from st albans and gave not unpropitious answers although that very morning margaret had doomed to execution the unfortunate bunville and curel as a proof of their good intentions they undertook to move back their army out of reach of the city accordingly on thursday the twenty fifth the northerners in a state of deep disgust were sent back to dunstable the first demand which the queen had made on london was for a supply of provisions for her army and on friday the twenty sixth the mayor and aldermen gathered a long train of wagons laden with all sorts of victuals and much lenten stuff and prepared to dispatch it northward the city however was in a great state of disturbance public feeling was excited by the plundering of the lancastrians and news had arrived that the cause of york was not lost and that a yorkist army was marching to the relief of london to the horror of the more prudent citizens a mob headed by sir john wenlock's cook stopped the carts at newgate plundered the provisions and drove the wagoners away such an act was bound to draw down punishment and that same afternoon a great body of lancastrian men-at-arms under sir baldwin fulford was pushed up to westminster to overawe the city the londoners had to make up their minds that friday evening whether they would fight or submit and many were the heart searchings of the timid aldermen but on saturday morning their grief was turned into joy news arrived that warwick and the earl of march were at hand fulford's men abandoned westminster and fell back northward and ere the day was out the travel-stained troops of the yorkist lords were defiling into the city by nightfall ten thousand men were within the gates and all thought of surrender was gone thus king henry's good intentions and queen margaret's unexpected irresolution had lost london to the lancastrians but their army still lay in a threatening attitude at dunstable and it seemed inevitable that the earl of march would have either to fight a battle or to stand a siege before he was a week older but before the fate of england was put to the arbitrament of combat there was one thing to be done the cruel deaths of york and salisbury had driven the quarrel between york and lancaster beyond the possibility of accommodation in spite of all the personal respect that was felt for king henry it was no longer possible that the heir of duke richard should be content to pose merely as the destined successor to the throne now that henry was again in the hands of his wife and the beauforts it was certain that the royal name would be used to the utmost against the yorkists they must have some cry to set against the appeal to national loyalty which would be made in the name of king henry no doubt warwick and edward had settled the whole matter on their ride from chipping norton to london for their action showed every sign of having been long planned out on the sunday morning within twenty-four hours of their arrival in the city their army was drawn out in the great field outside clerkenwell and while a great multitude of londoners stood by george bishop of exeter the orator of the neville clan made a solemn statement of edward's claim to the throne at once soldiers and citizens joined in the shout god save king edward and there was no doubt of the spontaneity of their enthusiasm the heart of the people was with york and it only remained necessary to legalize their choice by some form of election save the three nevilles warwick Falkenbridge and bishop george there seems to have been no peer with edward at the moment warwick felt that it would not look well that his cousin should ostensibly receive his crown from the nevilles alone whatever might be the reality of the case accordingly the few yorkist peers within reach were hastily summoned the archbishop of canterbury came in from kent where he had been waiting for better times the duke of norfolk lord fitzwalter lord ferrers of chartley and the bishop of salisbury appeared ere two days were out then these eight peers spiritual and temporal with a dozen or so of knights and a deputation of london citizens solemnly met at baynard's castle and declared edward king there had not been an instance of the election of a monarch 
by such a scanty body of supporters since the meeting of the Witan that chose Henry I. The House of Neville and their cousin of Norfolk were practically the sole movers in the business. Next day, Thursday, March 4th, Edward rode in state to Westminster with his scanty following of notables. There, before the high altar, he declared his title and sat on his throne with the scepter of Edward the Confessor in his hands beneath a canopy, receiving the homage and fealty of his adherents. Then, embarking in a state barge, he returned by water to the tower, where he fixed his abode, deserting the York family mansion of Baynard's castle. Meanwhile, the heralds proclaimed him at every street corner as Edward IV, King of France and England, and Lord of Ireland. Every one had been expecting that the coronation would be interrupted by the news that Queen Margaret's army was thundering at the gates. But no signs of the approach of an enemy appeared, and that same day it was known that the Queen had broken up from Dunstable and marched away northward. Her troops were in a state of incipient disbandment. They had refused to obey the King's proclamation against plunder, and had melted away by thousands, some to harry the home counties, some to bear off booty already obtained. The men that still adhered to the standards were so few and so discontented that the Lancastrian lords begged the Queen to retreat. They had heard exaggerated rumours of the strength of King Edward and dared not fight him. Accordingly, Henry, his wife and son and his nobles, with their whole following, rode off down the Watling Street, sending before them messengers to raise the whole force of the north and to bid it meet their retiring army on the borders of Yorkshire. The festivities of the coronation had not prevented the Yorkist lords from keeping the imminence of their danger close before their eyes. The ceremony had taken place on Thursday afternoon. By early dawn on Friday, Mowbray had written off eastward to array his followers in Norfolk and Suffolk. On the Saturday, Warwick himself marched out by the Great North Road with the war-tried troops who had fought under him at St. Albans and accompanied his retreat to Chipping Norton. He moved on cautiously, gathering in the Yorkist knights of the Midlands and his own Warwickshire and Worcestershire retainers till he had been joined by the whole force of his party. For four or five days after Warwick had set forth, the levies of the southern counties continued to pour into London. On the 10th, the main body of infantry marched on to unite with the Earl. They were some 15,000 strong, marchmen from the Welsh border and Kentishmen, for Kent, ever loyal to York, had turned out its archers in full force under a notable captain named Robert Horne. Finally, King Edward, who had remained behind till the last available moment, cheering the Londoners, bidding for the support of doubtful adherents, getting together money, and signing the manifold documents which had to be drawn up on his accession, started with his personal following amid the cheers of the citizens and the cries for vengeance on King Henry and his wife. Warwick had pushed forward cautiously, keeping in his front some light horse under John Ratcliffe, who claimed the barony of Fitzwalter. King Edward, on the other hand, came on at full speed and was able to overtake his vanguard at Leicester. Mowbray, with the troops from the eastern counties, was less ready. He was several days behind the king, and, as we shall see, did not come up till the actual eve of battle. There had been some expectations that the Lancastrians would fight on the line of the Trent, for the northern lords tarried some days at Nottingham. But as Warwick pushed on, he had always found the enemy retreating before him. Their route could be traced by the blazing villages on each side of their path, for the northern men had gone homewards excited to bitter wrath by the loss of the plunder of London. They had eaten up the whole countryside, swept off the horses, pulled the very houses to pieces in search of hidden goods, stripped every man, woman, and child they met of purse and raiment, even to the beggars who came out to ask them for charity, and slain every man that raised a hand against them. Beyond the Trent, they said they were in an enemy's country. In the eyes of every southern man, the measure of their iniquities was full. 
when warwick and king edward learnt that the queen and the northern lords had drawn their plundering bands north of the trent they had not much difficulty in settling the direction of their march it was practically certain that the lancastrians would be found on one of the positions across the great north road which covered the approach to york now as in every age since the romans built their great line of communication between north and south it would be on the line between york and lincoln that the fate of northern england would be decided the only doubt was whether the lancastrians would choose to defend the don or the air or the wharf behind each of which they might take up their position on the friday march twenty sixth the yorkists crossed the don unmolested but the news was not long in reaching them that the enemy lay behind the next obstacle the air now swollen to a formidable torrent by the spring rains and likely to cause much trouble ere it could be crossed king henry with his wife and son lay at york but all his lords with their retainers lay in the villages about tadcaster and caywood midway between the wharf and air with their central camp hard by the church of towton which was destined to give its name to the coming battle to secure the passage of the air was now the task that was incumbent on the yorkists accordingly their vanguard under lord fitzwalter was sent forward in haste on to ferry bridge where the roman road crosses the stream contrary to expectation the place was found unoccupied and its all-important bridge secured the line of the air was won but the friday was not destined to pass without bloodshed the northern lords cursing the carelessness which had lost them their line of defence determined to fall on the advanced guard of the enemy and beat it out of ferry bridge before the main body should come up lord clifford who commanded the nearest detachment rode off at once from towton and charged into ferry bridge while the newly arrived yorkists were at their meal fitzwalter had kept as careless a watch as his enemies he was taken unprepared his men were routed and he himself slain as he tried to rally them at nightfall clifford held the town and slept there undisturbed next morning however the situation was changed somerset or rather the council of the lancastrian lords had taken no measure to support clifford he was left alone at ferry bridge with the few thousand men of his original forces while the main army was slowly gathering on towton hillside eight miles to the rear meanwhile the yorkist main body was approaching ferry bridge from the south and a detached column under lord Falconbridge, stoutest of warwick's many uncles was trying the dangerous passage at castleford three miles away where there was no one to resist them hearing that Falconbridge was already across and was moving round to cut him off from his base clifford evacuated ferrybridge and fell back towards his main body he had already accomplished six of the eight miles of his journey when near dintingdale Falconbridge suddenly came in upon his flank with a very superior force clifford had so nearly reached his friends that he was marching in perfect security the yorkists scattered his men before they could form up to fight and killed him ere he had even time to brace on his helmet the survivors of his detachment were chased in upon the lancastrian main army which was so badly served by its scouts that it had neither heard of folk and bridges approach nor taken any measures to bring in clifford's party in safety nay so inert were the lancastrian commanders that they did not after the skirmish march out to beat off Falconbridge, whose friends were still miles away painfully threading the bridge of ferry bridge or the ford at castleford all through saturday the yorkists were slowly coming up to reinforce their vanguard but the roads and the weather were so bad that the rear was still on the other side of the air when night fell however the main body was safely concentrated on a ridge south of saxton village and probably thirty-five thousand out of edward's forty-eight thousand men were in line though much famished for victuals the belated rear-guard which was destined to form the right wing of the army on the morrow was composed of the troops from the eastern counties under mowbray with him were sir john wenlock and sir john dinham two of warwick's most trusted friends they were not expected to come up till some hours after daybreak on sunday morning with the yorkist main body were the king 
warwick his brother john his uncle Falconbridge, lord scroop lord berners lord stanley sir william hastings sir john stafford sir walter blunt robert horne the leader of the kentishmen and many other south country knights and squires two miles north of the yorkist camp at saxton the lancastrians lay in full force on towton hillside they had with them the largest army that was ever put into the field during the whole war somerset exeter james butler the irish earl who had endeavoured to rival warwick's power in wiltshire courtney earl of devon molins hungerford and willoughby had brought in the south country adherents of lancaster those at least of them whom the fields of st albans and northampton had left unharmed and unabashed sir andrew trollope was there with the remnant of the trained troops from calais who had deserted york at ludford in the previous year but the bulk of the sixty thousand men who served under the red rose were the retainers of the northern lords henry percy of northumberland appeared in person with all his following the durham vassals of the elder house of neville were arraigned under john lord neville the younger brother of rafe of westmoreland though the earl himself was now as always not forthcoming in person beside the neville and percy retainers were the bands of lord dacre wells roos beaumont manley and the dead clifford of all the barons and knights indeed of the north country save the younger house of neville the lancastrian position was very strong eight miles north of ferry bridge the great north road is flanked by a long plateau some hundred and fifty feet above the level of the surrounding country the first rising ground to the west that breaks the plain of york the high road to tadcaster creeps along its eastern foot and then winds round its northern extremity its western side is skirted by a brook called the cock which was then in flood and only passable at a few points beside the bridge where the high road crosses it the lancastrians were drawn up across the plateau their left wing on the high road their right touching the steep bank of the cock one flank was completely covered by the flooded stream while the other the one which lay over the road could only be turned by the enemy if he went down into the plain and exposed himself to a flank attack while executing his movement the ground however was very cramped for an army of sixty thousand men it was less than a mile and a half in breadth and it seems likely that the lancastrians must contrary to the usual english custom have formed several lines one in the rear of the other in order to crowd their men on to such a narrow space the yorkists at saxton lay just on the southern declivity of the plateau within two miles of the lancastrian line of battle whose general disposition must have been rendered sufficiently evident by the countless watch-fires along the rising ground although they knew themselves to be outnumbered by the enemy warwick and king edward were determined to attack each of them had a father to revenge and they were not disposed to count heads before it was dawn at four o'clock on the morning of that eventful palm sunday the yorkist army was drawn out the king rode down the line bidding them remember that they had the just cause and the men began to climb the gentle ascent of the towton plateau the left wing which was slightly in advance of the main body was led by Falconbridge, the great central mass by warwick in person the king was in command of the reserve of the details of the marshalling we know no more but the yorkist line though only thirty five thousand strong was drawn up on a front equal to that which the sixty thousand lancastrians occupied and must therefore have been much thinner when norfolk and the missing right wing should appear it was obvious that they would outflank the enemy on the side of the plain warwick's plan therefore was evidently to engage the lancastrians so closely and so occupy their attention that norfolk should be able to take them in flank without molestation on his arrival in the dusk of the march morning with a strong north wind blowing in their faces the clumps of yorkist billmen and archers commenced to mount the hill no opposition was made to their approach but when they had advanced for one thousand yards along the summit of the plateau 
they dimly descried the lancastrian host in order of battle on the farther side of a slight dip in the ground called towtendale at the same moment the wind veered round and a heavy fall of snow commenced to beat in the faces of the lancastrians so thick was it that the two armies could only make out each other's position from the simultaneous shout of defiance which ran down each line Folkenbridge, whose wing lay nearest to the enemy determined to utilize the accident of the snow in a manner which throws the greatest credit on his presence of mind he sent forward his archers to the edge of the dip in the plateau with orders to discharge a few flights of arrows into the lancastrian columns and then to retire back again to the line of battle this they did the wind bore their arrows into the crowded masses who with the snow beating into their eyes could not see the enemy that was molesting them and considerable execution was done accordingly the whole lancastrian line of archers commenced to reply but as they were shooting against the wind and as folkenbridge's men had withdrawn after delivering their volley it resulted that the northerners continued to pour a heavy flight of arrows into the unoccupied ground forty yards in front of the yorkist position their fire was so fast and furious that ere very long their shafts began to run short when this became noticeable folkenbridge led his men forward again to the edge of towtendale and recommenced his deadly volleys into the enemy's right wing the lancastrians could make little or no reply their store of missiles being almost used up their position was growing unbearable and with a simultaneous impulse the whole mass facing folkenbridge plunged down into towtendale to cross the dip and fall on the enemy at close quarters the movement spread down the line from west to east and in a few minutes the two armies were engaged along their whole front thus the lancastrians though fighting on their own chosen ground had to become the assailants and were forced to incur the disadvantage of having the slope against them as they struggled up the southern side of the declivity of towtendale of all the battles of the wars of the roses perhaps indeed of all the battles in english history the fight of towton was the most desperate and the most bloody for sheer hard fighting there is nothing that can compare to it from five in the morning to midday the battle never slackened for a moment no one ever again complained that the southern men were less tough than the northern time after time the lancastrians rolled up the southern slope of towtendale and flung themselves on the yorkist host sometimes they were driven down at once sometimes they pushed the enemy back for a space but they could never break the king's line each time that an attacking column was repelled newly rallied troops took its place and the push of pike never ceased we catch one glimpse of warwick in the midst of the tumult warren tells how the greatest press of the battle lay on the quarter where the earl of warwick stood and wedhamstead describes him pressing on like a second hector and encouraging his young soldiers but there is little to be gathered about the details of the fight there cannot have been much to learn for each combatant lost in the mist and drifting snow could tell only of what was going on in his own immediate neighbourhood they have only left us vague pictures of horror the dead hindered the living from coming to close quarters they lay so thick there was more red than white visible on the snow are the significant remarks of the chronicler king henry as he heard his palm sunday mass in york minster ten miles away he was kept off the field because he was better at praying than at fighting says the yorkist chronicler may well have redoubled his prayers for never was there to be such a slaughter of englishmen at length the object for which warwick's stubborn billmen had so long maintained their ground against such odds was attained the column under the duke of norfolk which was to form the yorkist right wing began to come up from ferrybridge its route brought it out on the extreme left flank of the lancastrians where the high road skirts the plateau too heavily engaged in front to suspect that all the army of york was not yet before them somerset and his colleagues had made no provision against a new force appearing beyond their left wing thus norfolk's advancing columns were able to turn the exposed flank 
open and enfilading fire upon the enemy's left rear and what was still more important to cut him off from all lines of retreat save that which led across the flooded cock the effect of norfolk's advance was at once manifest the battle began to roll northward and westward as the lancastrians gave back and tried to form a new front against the unsuspected enemy but the moment that they began to retire the whole yorkist line followed them the arrival of norfolk had been to warwick's men what the arrival of blucher was to wellington's at waterloo after having fought all the day on the defensive they had their opportunity at last and were eager to use it when the lancastrians had once begun to retire they found themselves so hotly pushed on that they could never form a new line of battle their gross numbers were crushed more and more closely together as the pressure on their left flank became more and more marked and if any reserves yet remained in hand there was no way of bringing them to the front yet as all the chroniclers acknowledge the northern men gave way to no panic they turned again and again and strove to dispute every step between Towtendale and the edge of the plateau. It took three hours more of fighting to roll them off the rising ground, but when once they were driven down their position became terrible. The cock when in flood is in many places unfordable, sometimes it spreads out so as to cover the fields for fifty yards on each side of its wonted bed, and the only safe retreat across it was by the single bridge at the Tadcaster Road. The sole result of the desperate fighting of the Lancastrians was that this deadly obstacle now lay in their immediate rear. The whole mass was compelled to pass the river as best it could. Some escaped by the bridge, many forded the cock where its stream ran shallow, many yielded themselves as prisoners, some to get quarter, others not for the Yorkists were wild with the rage of ten hours' slaughter. But many thousands had a worse fortune. Striving to ford the river where it was out of their depth or trodden down in the shallower parts by their own flying comrades, they died without being touched by the Yorkist steel. Any knight or man-at-arms who lost his footing in the water was doomed, for the cumbrous armor of the later fifteenth century made it quite impossible to rise again. Even the billman and archer, in his sallet and jack, would find it hard to regain his feet. Hence we may well believe the chroniclers when they tell us that the cock slew its thousands that day, and that the last Lancastrians who crossed its waters crossed them on a bridge composed of the bodies of their comrades. Even this ghastly scene was not to be the end of the slaughter. The Yorkists urged the pursuit for miles from the field, nearly to the gates of York, still slaying as they went. The hapless King Henry with his wife and son were borne out of the town by their flying followers, who warned them that the enemy was still close behind and were fain to take the road for Durham and the border. Only Richard Tunstall, the king's chamberlain, and five horsemen more guarded them during the flight. When Warwick and King Edward drew in their men from the pursuit and bade the heralds count the slain, they must have felt that their fathers were well avenged. Nearly thirty thousand corpses lay on the trampled snow of the plateau, or blocked the muddy course of the cock, or strewed the road to Tadcaster and York, and of these only eight thousand were Yorkists. The sword had fallen heavily on the Lancastrian leaders. The Earl of Northumberland was carried off by his followers, mortally wounded, and died next day. Of the barons, Dacre, Neville, Mawley, and Wells lay on the field. Thomas Courtney, the Earl of Devon, was taken alive, a worse fate than that of his fellows, for the headsman's axe awaited him. Of leaders below the baronial rank, there were slain Sir Andrew Trollope, the late lieutenant of Calais, Sir Rafe Grey, Sir Henry Beckenham, and many more whom it would be tedious to name. The slaughter had been as deadly to the northern knighthood as was Flodden a generation later to the noble houses of Scotland. There was hardly a family that did not to mourn the loss of its head or heir. The uphill fight which the Yorkists had to wage during the earlier hours of the day had left its mark in their ranks. Eight thousand had fallen, one man for every six in the field. But the leaders had come off fortunately. Only Sir John Stafford, and Robert Horne, the Kentish captain, had fallen. 
so long indeed as the fight ran level the knights in their armour of proof were comparatively safe it was always the pursuit which proved so fatal to the chiefs of a broken army End of chapter 10